Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another of the regular monthly meetings of Libertarian Alliance here at the regular place. So it might become so, <laughs> given the prices. <laughs> and the fact we now have found out to get into it. <coughs> Tonight's speaker is uh, Richard Wellings. Are you Dr. Richard? Yes. Dr. Yes. Richard Wellings. A long time says, ago. Yeah. Far more true than I was to be the case. And he's speaking tonight on Is lib Neoliberalism Finished? Question mark. <coughs> Thanks very much, Bob. Um, so, I'm going to start off with a, a slogan. Um, Neoliberalism was born in Chile and it will die in Chile. This has become a popular slogan for the protests that are now going on in Santiago and other major cities in Chile. Um, this is, it's actually been really terrible, probably far worse than Hong Kong, but for some reason it hasn't really received much media coverage. But around uh, 25 people have been killed in the protests mm. that have been, now been going on for several weeks. Of course, it's not true that neoliberalism was born in Chile. Uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, neoliberal policies in se several sectors were um, enacted under General Pinochet after the uh, CIA-backed coup in 1973. Uh, and uh, Milton Friedman students, the so-called Chicago boys, um, advised the Pinochet regime and implemented various neoliberal-inspired policies. Um, <clears throat> so that's one example where there seems to be a at the moment, a pushback against uh, neoliberal ideas. Um, also in Europe and North America, so in France for the past 57 weekends, we've had the uh, Gilets Jaunes uh, protesting against Emmanuel Macron's policies. Of course, Macron himself is widely viewed as someone with neoliberal sympathies. And he was certainly very strongly supported by um, neoliberals uh, across Europe, including in the UK, during his uh, election campaign. In the UK, there's clearly a pushback against neoliberal inspired policies. So um, there's some survey evidence that um, there's now deep, deep uh, scepticism about the various privatisation models that were introduced in the 80s and 90s uh, with a large majority of the public in favour of renationalisation um, of various privatised sectors. Uh, it varies by sector, but generally is widespread public support for renationalisation. And obviously, we've also seen the, the Conservative Party, probably even dates back to the major era in the 1990s, uh, being increasingly comfortable with big government and uh, large scale public spending. And clearly, the sort of privatisation programme of the 80s and early 90s is now finished. There's no real stomach for any more privatisation in that direction. Obviously, in the US, you've got Donald Trump and with a sort of sea change within the Republican Party against some of these uh, managed trade deals, uh, against relatively free immigration policy. Definitely a big shift there that could be interpreted as a, a move against neoliberalism. So I think um, this discussion on neoliberalism and its future is actually very timely at the moment. Um, to summarise my, my views in advance, I think um, a lot of this unpopularity is due to uh, neoliberalism's uh, tendency to uh, de degenerate into and feed off uh, crony capitalism. Absolutely. I think it's a tendency with neoliberalism. And a, a, a related problem um, with neoliberalism, it's kind of been tarnished by its, its association with some very uh, controversial uh, political figures as well. So, um, I mean, obviously, I've already mentioned General Pinochet, who I think killed around 3,000 uh, opposition um, activists uh, in the few years after the coup in 1973. <clears throat> but obviously, in a sense, he's a fringe, fringe figure, and... Um, uh, the, main, the main political figures associated with neoliberalism are, of course, uh, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Um, now, uh, taking Reagan first, um, I, I, you know, I used to be moderately sympathetic to Ronald Reagan. Um, I was never sort of a, a massive fan. But then I sort of started delving into his uh, record, particularly on foreign policy, and I became increasingly appalled by what he did. So... Um, just to give you a few examples, um, in Afghanistan, of course, he was uh, his administration was arming and funding the uh, 
then Mujahideen, these uh, jihadists who later morphed into the Taliban and Al Qaeda. Um, then we have it, it's you know it gets worse. Um, then there were the the Central American death squads that were armed and friendly by the CIA committee, you know, just kept going around massacring whole villages, killing all the women and children. And, and obviously the Iran, Iran gate scandal which was all to do with the covert funding of that. <clears throat> and then there was the Iran-Iraq war um, in the 1980s, I think it was 1980 to 1988, killed around uh, 1.5 <coughs> million people. And the uh, US government under Reagan was arming and funding <coughs> along with its satellites, um, Saddam Hussein, of course, who invaded Iran, who, that's actually started the war in 1980, where still the uh, US forces under Reagan were actually helping Saddam uh, target Iranian forces with chemical weapons. And those very same chemical weapons, of course, were uh, being supplied by Western firms with the collusion of Western governments uh, to Saddam Hussein in the 1980s. <clears throat> but, the one that really takes the biscuit with Reagan is um, Pol Pot. So backing Pol Pot in the 1980s, who's, I mean, there, there are some lunatic communist leaders, but I think Pol Pot's the, the biggest lunatic of the lot. Um, so, you know, killed up to three million Cambodians, with these crazy year zero policies. Yet here we have the US government, also the UK government, um, supporting him. <coughs> because they were trying to stop, uh, obviously Vietnam was a sin as an enemy and he was a, an obstacle to the Vietnamese. So, I mean, these, these are just horrific. So, this is the conclusion, horrific conclusion. So, Ronald Reagan, who's this neoliberal hero, was actually a major league war criminal, really, really did some really, really bad things. Margaret Thatcher, obviously, you know, uh, UK foreign policy was... Um, just basically being America's poodle, as it has been since World War II. So, I mean, you know, can't necessarily put the blame on her, but for all the talk of her promoting freedom, she was absolutely terrible on civil liberties, cracking down on free speech, and misusing the deep state against her political opponents, and, uh, you know, very sort of cavalier attitude to the rule of law, a very long way from classical liberal principles. But anyway, um, I'm going to leave... Read out a quote here, and this is Murray Rothbard on, on Ronald Reagan. Um, Reagan has been a master at engineering, an enormous gap between his rhetoric and the reality of his actions. All politicians, of course, have such a gap, but in Reagan it is cosmic, massive, as wide as the Pacific Ocean. His soft, soapy voice appears perfectly sincere as he spouts the rhetoric which he violates day by day. Wherever we look, on the budget, in the domestic economy, or in foreign trade or international military relations, we see governments even more on our backs than ever. The burden and scope of government intervention under Reagan has increased, not decreased. Reagan's rhetoric has been calling for reductions of, of government. His actions have been precisely the reverse, because, of course, it's not just foreign policy, he also massive, massively increased uh, government spending and the budget deficits. And Thatcher as well, I mean, there was barely any difference in the share of GDP uh, that was government spending in 1979 and when she left in 1990. It's only a small cut and that can be explained by the economic cycle, probably. And much of her so-called uh, deregulation was actually re-regulation, most famously the Big Bang, the uh, reform of the financial markets. This actually uh, um, made illegal a lot of the private regulation that had evolved voluntarily in the City of London and replaced it with statutory regulation and government bureaucracy, uh, which of course tended to benefit the, the big crony capitalist uh, US investment banks, most of all. So obviously, because it's um, associated with these people who are in the public's mind uh, villains. Uh, neoliberalism has a, a major public uh, relations problem, you know, because it's associated with these uh, Pinochet, Reagan and Thatcher in the public's mind. Um, but this is also a problem for libertarians and supporters of genuine free markets because, of course, um, generally uh, libertarians are tarnished with the same brush as neoliberals and thought of as uh, part of the same kind of gang of, 
ideological group, even though, as I'm going to argue, I think this is completely wrong. So the failures of neoliberalism get attached to free markets and libertarianism, giving libertarianism and free markets a bad name. And in fact, I will argue that um, neoliberalism is better understood as just another particular form of state capitalism rather than uh, an ideology an ideology that really believes in free markets. So let's go on to um, some definitions here. Um, I'm going to start with a dictionary definition, which I, I wouldn't usually do, but this um, illustrates some of the widespread uh, misunderstandings that occur in this area. So this is a, a dictionary definition. Neoliberalism is a modern politico-economic theory favouring free trade, privatisation, minimal government intervention in business, reduced expenditure on social services. But this is surely uh, way off the mark, because obviously the kind of managed trade deals that neoliberals typically advocate are a very long way from actual free trade, for example. And the, um, the artificial markets that they advocate are obviously a very long way from free markets, these government regulated artificial markets. And some of the Marxist definitions are also off the mark. So here's one from uh, David Harvey, who I think uh, used to be a professor at Oxford. Um, Neoliberalism is in the first instance a theory of political economic practices that proposes that human well-being can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework characterised by strong property rights, free markets and free trade. The role of the state is to create and preserve an institutional framework appropriate to such practices. But as we'll see in more detail later, uh, neoliberal policies are in fact very far away from genuinely free markets. Um, from uh, Jeff Dice at the Mises Institute, we have a rather different description of neoliberalism. Um, the basic programme of late 20th century liberalism social democracy, public education, civil rights, entitlements, welfare, feminism, and the degree of global governance, coupled with at least grudging, if not open, respect for the role of markets in improving human life. In other words, neoliberals are left liberals who accept the role of markets and the need for economic development as part of the larger liberal programme. This vision, of course, includes Western interventionism, military, diplomatic, and economic, in all world affairs, led always by the US. I think this is probably getting close to the mark, at least in terms of how neoliberal ideas have been translated into real world policy. The history of neoliberal ideas also helps us pin down some sort of understanding of the perspective. One um, obvious clue is the name, the word neoliberal, i.e. new liberal. And the point here is that it was something different from classical liberalism. It was a rejection of classical liberal laissez-faire. Um, so one of the influential schools was um, German ordo-liberalism, which emerged most powerfully in the first half of the um, 20th century. Um, and I think this ordo-liberalism contains many of the seeds of neoliberalism and its rejection of laissez-faire, its concern with social justice and social cohesion, and in particular, its advocacy of um, state-regulated markets with um, artificial competition promoted by the state. And uh, Mrs. Thatcher's favourite economist, of course, was uh, Friedrich von Hayek. And he was very much uh, schooled in the auto liberal tradition in the 1930s. Obviously, later on in his career, one thinks of, for example, denationalisation of money, which I think was published in the maybe 1975 or 1976, roughly. That was a, a pretty libertarian piece, but earlier on he was more of an auto liberal. And he was important in spreading auto liberal ideas to the Anglo Saxon world, for example, through uh, the Mont Pelerin Society, which he helped to found after World War II. Um, and of course, the inclusion of the auto liberals in the Mont Pelerin Society might explain uh, Ludwig von Mises' uh, angry reaction to one of the, their early meetings when he stormed out shouting, you're all a bunch of socialists. So, so he wasn't one person who wasn't too happy with this drift towards interventionism. Obviously another strand 
was the uh, Chicago School in the uh, second half of the 20th century, led in particular by Milton Friedman. Obviously, it, it predates that, but nonetheless, this was an important uh, strand of neoliberal thinking. Um, so they were particularly important in terms of the neoliberal policies towards uh, the monetary system, supporting central banks, and the idea that you could use the money supply, you could essentially plan the money supply using it as some sort of lever to regulate the economy, which of course is anathema to Austrians like Mises and Hayek. But nonetheless, they had far more influence <coughs> over this monetary system that was created. And of course, I do think they are at least partly to blame for the financial crisis in 2007 because of their monetarist policies uh, created all these, these bubbles, uh, which in turn exposed this really egregious, um, cosy relationship between the central bank's politicians and uh, big financial firms, really the epitome of crony capitalism. Um, and of course, the financial crisis, I think, unfairly, of course, because this is more of a neoliberal generated crisis than a free market generated crisis, but it has dis done probably more than anything else to discredit free markets in the eyes of the public. Um, now, I'm going to, I don't think we've really got to grips with a, a good definition of neoliberalism yet, but I'm going to move on to a series of policy examples which I think will help flesh out how neoliberalism would differ from uh, libertarian policies or free market policies. And helpfully, um, the Adam Smith Institute, um, about three or four months ago, published a, a neoliberal manifesto which sets out neoliberal policies in a, a series of areas. Now, a note of caution, obviously, there's a, a variety of views within what we might call neoliberalism, and not a, every neoliberal is going to agree precisely with these policies. But nonetheless, it, it's you know useful in, in an indicative sense. So... <coughs> As I mentioned um, earlier, just now, on monetary policy, neoliberals uh, tend to support central banks and centrally planning the money supply. Mm. They support inflation, albeit at a fairly low rate, but nonetheless, this can accumulate in terms of huge distortions to the economy, as we saw in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, whereas, obviously, libertarians would tend to prefer um, voluntary competing currencies and debate whether that would lead to some sort of gold commodity-based currency through market action over time through the discovery process. On, for on foreign policy, uh, neoliberals tend to be relatively comfortable with overseas intervention and, and Western imperialism. Now, I would say they're typically less aggressive than the neocons on this. Um, they certainly don't share the anti-war, anti-imperialism stance of the sort of uh, traditional classical liberals like Hopton and Bright and so on. Or, the uh, uh, yeah, Ron Paul libertarians. Uh, on health, uh, they tend to promote uh, state subsidised and regulated uh, compulsory social insurance systems. Um, on education, they tend to favour either state funded free schools or st a state funded voucher system rather than, you know, a lot of libertarians will say, let's get the state the hell out of education, you know, uh, make it voluntary and so on. So there's a huge huge cleavage in views on, on education. Um, on welfare, they uh, promote significant redistribution uh, to help uh, the less well-off, and they're more interested in making the welfare system more efficient uh, and to improve the incentive structures than actually uh, getting rid of this huge uh, transfer from one group of people to another. Obviously, libertarians would focus on a voluntary means to help the poor, for example, the extended family, charities, friendly societies, private insurance, etc., etc. On pensions, they often support um, compulsory uh, government-backed uh, savings schemes, as we saw in, uh, introduced in Chile under Pinochet. Once again, a big difference uh, with the libertarian perspective. On the environment, they're quite comfortable to adopt uh, the Pigovian uh, framework of um, taxing externalities and they kind of ignore a lot of the, the calculation problems involved in that and the problem of making interpersonal utility comparisons when a lot of the evaluations are deeply, deeply subjective in this area. I mean, some of them are even, they even claim some compulsory emissions trading scheme like the 
EU imposes all a carbon tax. They say these are free market policies. I mean, how cretinous is that? It's just ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> finally, on transport and utilities, and this covers a lot of the privatised sectors, um, they, promote, they, they, they prefer the government to impose um, artificial structures on these industries in order to uh, promote <coughs> artificial competition. So they favour open access on the railways, which basically <coughs> Uh, prohibits genuine private ownership and also leads to um, <coughs> industry structures that are hugely inefficient because you have to have all this vast bureaucracy and fragmentation to enable this fake competition and you, you know, destroy economies of scale and increase the transaction costs. Um, so you know, they, they don't even allow the kind of evolution of industrial structures that would an, occur in the market processes. Um, so I think we've got a kind of idea of, you know, why it's so different from, why neoliberalism is so diff different from libertarianism and free markets, and even, you know, very different from classical liberalism as well. Um, <coughs> let me move on to some of the, the critiques and, and start off with the economic ones. Um, so we've seen that neoliberalism isn't actually about laissez-faire, rather um, neoliberal policies involve governments imposing a particular market structure by force. Um, and this means there's a, a severe um, public choice problem with neoliberal policies, because uh, as with any political processes, the creation and um, sustenance, maintenance of these um, artificial markets is a political process, which means this process can be uh, influenced or captured by special interests. Um, so, uh, in practice, this means that um, these uh, neoliberal um, artificial markets have a tendency to be um, to uh, create a crony capitalism, whereby um, politically connected special interests are able to basically shape the market or protect it from um, create barriers of entry to protect themselves from competition. Um, and we see this with the privatizations of the 1980s and 1990s. Um, so this wasn't <coughs> going from state ownership to free markets. This was very much going from state capitalism model A to state capitalism model B. Um, and it didn't produce anything like free markets. It created these heavily regulated markets under nominal uh, private ownership, but effectively directed by the government in many ways. I mean, now, <clears throat> the, um, the pathologies of nationalised industries, state ownership, are obviously well known. But the point is that many of the um, privatised sectors exhibit broadly similar problems to the nationalised industries of the past. And I'm just going to explain some reasons why um, neoliberal policies could potentially fail to produce significant benefits com compared with the and nationalized industries of the past. Basically, people think it's, you know, the more free market it gets, the more efficient it gets in sort of a straight line. But it actually doesn't necessarily work like that. You might find that um, state ownership more, could be more efficient in some sectors than the neoliberal option because of the reasons I'm going to set out. And then the true efficiency gains come further up the curve where you've got a genuine free market and proper entrepreneurship and so on. So these are various reasons why you can potentially get efficiency losses from neoliberal uh, artificial markets. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, the first point is that um, uh, politicisation, so potentially um, a sector might become more politicised after it's been privatised than it was before. Um, basically, this is because just the, the change in the status quo creates political risks. So we saw that with the railways, where um, the, the privatisation model was gradually undermined by uh, backbench Tory MPs who were <coughs> worried about their uh, constituents' uh, rail fares, and they called for more and more regulation, more and more control, uh, price controls, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that massively stultified the prospects for entrepreneurship in the sector. Um, obviously, uh, there are really massive costs for the politicians to get if they get regulation wrong because those costs are dispersed widely dispersed leading to limited accountability 
Um, <clears throat> then there's the issue of overregulation, which I think we've possibly seen in the uh, electricity and gas market. Uh, so the problem is that <coughs> if they mess things up when it's um, under state ownership, then they get their blame directly. So if you've got a massive increase in, in energy bills, the politicians get the blame. What actually happened was, though, that they could they were introducing all these ill-conceived green policies and they were able to shift the blame onto um, greedy private firms, which of course meant that there were uh, weaker incentives for them to actually uh, um, enact sensible, efficient policies. <coughs> so in, in a sense, the, this, the creation of this artificial market warped the incentives facing the politicians who were controlling it through regulation. And of course, um, voters have very weak incentives to get well informed about the true causes of you know, why their energy bills are going through the roof. If they can blame greedy energy companies, and that's great. It suits the politicians because they can disguise what's really going on. Another problem is, of course, you know, looking back at the 80s and 90s, uh, you know, the already uh, gov government um, borrowing and debt was often a big problem. And the privatisations were also bringing in big flotation receipts that were really useful for the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And clearly, um, if you want to get investors into investing in these private companies, it helps if you're going to rig the market to shut out competition and protect the long-term profits. <coughs> Especially, you know, with things like pension funds, they want a long, a long, reliable, long-term reliable stream of profits. And what you don't want is too much disruption to the market. So that, in a sense, gave the politicians an incentive to create these very heavily regulated markets that could guarantee a certain profit level. It, it was even built into the, the price regulation model in, in several sectors like water uh, and the airports and so on because they, it was based on the regulated asset base. So, you know, this, this, this meant that obviously this was a big incentive not to have a free market that, where you know, the whole thing could be disrupted and the, these uh, people would be less willing to invest. I mean, that's personally my, my own investment strategy is you know, anything that's like a free market, I avoid like the play. You want a, a nice rigged <laughs> market where the government's, government's protecting the profits, you know. <laughs> so, um, uh, um, then the other issue is transaction costs, most famously again on the railway. So if you create these, um, the need for artificial competition and these layers of bureaucracy fragmentation, it also introduces transaction costs between the various layers in the industry. And that's why... Um, in the early years, of course, the railways, within two or three years, George Stevenson abandoned the open access model and went for vertical integration because these transaction costs were so huge, all the hassle involved in having different people using the same bit of railway. Massive hassle, so he quickly got rid of them and said, we're going to run the trains ourselves and get rid of all the hassle. Sure. Yeah, but, but of course, <coughs> that's not allowed at the moment. These takeovers are not allowed. It's even not allowed by EU law. Full, uh, full private ownership isn't allowed by EU law. Um, <clears throat> moral hazard, this is another problem as well. If, um, if the, uh, in, in these artificial markets, if the particular service or good is viewed as essential, then the firms engaged in it know that the government's going to bail them out if things go wrong. Uh, famous, we saw this famously, obviously, in the financial crisis, the ramps of the financial crisis with these, effectively, the the profits being privatised and the risks being socialised with these huge bailouts in various ways. So um, that's another problem with the artificial markets. Yeah, finally to sum up, um, you know, this combination of uh, heavy regulation and private ownership could actually increase the financial incentives for, for rent seeking. So if you're, the, you know, the former nationalised firms, the people involved they have very little to gain on an individual basis from uh, getting more subsidies and so on, or relatively little to gain. Uh, or, or, I mean, clearly, clearly there still was a rent-seeking problem, but potentially it can get even worse with these artificial markets than neoliberals advocate, because there are now massive financial incentives for the private firms involved to lobby the government to maintain this artificial structure that benefits themselves or to increase the subsidies for the particular sector. Um, there's much bigger financial incentives, and we saw that in a lot of the privatised areas where the amount of lobbying has gone through the roof and the subsidies have gone through the roof as well. So that's another problem. That's what I mean. My point is it's better to push through to genuine free markets rather than being stuck with this uh, hybrid 
halfway house that doesn't really work properly. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, this sort of quasi-crony capitalism, but it's really uh, a case of the formation of distributional coalitions. So a group of firms and bureaucrats that have a coincidence of interests to uh, sustain an artificial market that in turn rips off consumers and uh, taxpayers. Um, this is the problem. So I don't normally agree with uh, Paul Mason, but he made this point about the, the collapse of the construction firm Carillion. Uh, he wrote, uh, Carillion's entire history encapsulates the rise and fall of neoliberalism. <coughs> it was a machine for turning taxes collected by the state into profits for shareholders and bonuses for managers. So this is exactly what we saw uh, private firms and government bureaucrats profiting at the expense of taxpayers and consumers, which is exactly what public choice theory would predict. Um, and finally, it should be noted that flawed artificial markets have uh, imposed economic uh, losses on a wider level as well, because they bring, unfairly of course, but they bring unfairly um, free markets into disrepute more generally, uh, then the when there is a reaction to these um, artificial markets that degrade into crony capitalism, it then has a knock-on effect on the political culture, which means that there's likely to be more and more state control as a reaction to this, which of course is what we've seen in, in various uh, privatised sectors. Um, I should add as well that the um, empirical record of neoliberal policies is, is mixed and difficult to draw conclusions from. So, um, you know, the the left sort of analysis uh, says that we had a, an era of Keynesianism and Fordism in the post-war period and then this, this change to a neoliberal era from the 70s and then strengthening in the 80s onwards. Um, and if you look at the, obviously the growth record of Western economies has been rather weak in the so-called neoliberal period, but of course that doesn't really prove anything because other economic models could have produced even worse growth and there may be the various other factors involved here. So it's difficult to draw conclusions from that. Um, and obviously neoliberals themselves would justify the claim that of course in very many sectors uh, neoliberal policies were never properly implemented, vast sectors, uh, health and education and the sort of welfare stuff in particular. So this is really you know, a bit of difficult, the, the empirical evidence really uh, isn't much use here. So going on to the conclusion, I should finally answer my question, is neoliberalism finished? Uh, well, I think it's highly unlikely. Um, and this is because um, in practice, neoliberalism is effectively a recipe for crony capitalism because it does produce these um, hugely powerful uh, special <coughs> interests that benefit from uh, rigged markets. And they obviously, in many cases, will be destroyed by genuinely free markets. Um, and the obvious example is the, the financial sector uh, which relies on central banking, all this inflation and money printing, as well as various other tax breaks, bailouts, and so on. And clearly, they're going to, you know, resist, you know, to the death any any sort of uh, libertarian policy that could upset their little cosy uh, stream of profits. But obviously, you could apply this to virtually any other sector of the economy. And this means that uh, concentrated special interests. Uh, have uh, strong financial incentives to uh, devote towards uh, <coughs> devote resources towards lobbying for a continuation of these artificial markets and uh, regulations and so on, and uh, that means they fund an extensive network of lobby groups who promote these kind <coughs> of uh, policies, uh, regulated artificial markets rather than genuine free markets. And unfortunately, this has created a tendency for uh, free market organisations to drift away from classical liberalism and libertarianism and towards neoliberalism because obviously this means uh, they get uh, more influence with policy makers that like to get funding from these special interests and obviously more uh, media coverage all the rest of it because they're not trying to upset the apple cart too much that's very much an establishment friendly kind of ideology whereas libertarianism isn't of course it's uh, you know <laughs> very very radical um, so uh, despite all the angry opposition, neoliberalism is still very much alive. And my recommendation is if you want um, money and influence, uh, a good career in uh, academia, 
media, um, politics, then don't be a libertarian, become a neoliberal. <laughs> but, but I do beg you, and this is my last point, if you do that, become a neoliberal, please don't describe yourself as free market. Thank you very much. <laughs>
French Revolution, you, the genocide of 10 million Native Americans and it's, it's mass land grab. And then the, um, you know, obviously it's reliance on, on slavery as well. And this is absolutely horrific. And uh, this mass, this new genocidal empire that was created on those false pretenses. Um, and nonetheless, um, yeah, I think really, I mean, I say that the, probably the difference between uh, neoliberals and social democrats is in terms of, I do think that social democrats would go further than neoliberals in terms of what they think the role, proper role of the state should be. And it's more a question of magnitude rather than underlying ideals to some extent. So they would favour much more redistribution and more, they'd have a more egalitarian <coughs> Uh, rationale rather than neoliberals yeah, would be concerned with the basic safety nets in terms of society. So I think that's a, a one big difference. Mm. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. One question I've got, and I don't have the answer to it, and I don't even have an opinion on it at the moment, mm -hmm. is where you have China now, how do you see it as a threat to neoliberalism, or do you see it as possibly irrelevant because eventually you have to adopt it? And is China going to give up easily the fact that it's got a policy now of dumping at below cost to wipe out competition so that it can dominate the market and put up transaction costs? Yeah, I mean, I think China's actually a, a threat to neoliberalism because although, I mean, some Marxists, they, they lump China's uh, liberalisation post, um, <coughs> was it 1978 or something, they lump that as sort of a neoliberal experiment, but I would see it very much in the tradition of Lenin's new economic policy. Mm -hmm. You know, where the, the communists, um, it was basically famine and disaster for the first three or four years. And so there's a massive U-turn where uh, Lenin allowed um, some private enterprise and small and medium-sized businesses, which is similar to what you have in China, because the big stuff's still very much, very heavily state controlled, you know, the big industries and so on. Um, and I think it is a threat because a lot of the, the neoliberal, um, if you like, rigged markets that benefit special interests, particularly in the US, um, I think once China reaches a, a critical mass, they can dispense with those. Uh, and the, the one I'm particularly thinking of is uh, intellectual property laws. We can, all, we can argue about you know, the, in, in uh, principle whether they're, they're right or wrong, but in practice, this is one of the, the key crony capitalist scams that's used to um, favour big US firms over their competition, basically to shut out competition, particularly from developing countries. And so I think they could start to break up a lot of these uh, neoliberal institutions. You know, they're going to uh, create, they're already trying to create their own competition for things like the World Bank and the IMF and so on. And they can also challenge the, the neoliberal inspired monetary system as well. Um, the question is whether there'll be, you know, there'll be some kind of uh, military attempted military intervention to try and it's smash that up. question. I mean, there's nothing I disagree with about what you just said, especially the intellectual property, which I see as basically solving the problem of China, because China is so basically 100% control freak on an economy that basically it suppresses creativity and intellectual property innovation. So effectively, uh, neoliberalism actually supports creativity like Xerox passes over to Apple, Apple passes over to Microsoft, it becomes incestuous, and it, you create a creative engine, but to do that, you've got to have freedom of movement of ideas, and China's not in favor of that, which puts China in a very difficult position, because it's got to commit theft to actually, to actually make up for the deficiency, which it's got an efficiency of having total control. But it's, not, it's not theft of physical property, though, is it? No. no, I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't agree that it's, it's theft because then, obviously, you, you know, these ideas, I, I don't believe, can be sort of homesteaded in the way that physical property can be. But that's, that's a debate Communist. for another... That's the debate for... <laughs> yeah, this is a debate that divides libertarians, and I'm an anti-intellectual well, property you, person. Just to clarify... You're anti-intellectual property. Mm. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no, I'm anti. Particularly patterns, I'm against. That's why you haven't got any. Yeah, I don't mind right. right. <laughs> as long as it's as short as twenty years. To have like sixty years, you know. Well, I mean, lo a lot of that was was uh, you know the these big U.S. corporations lobbied the U.S. government to uh, lengthen the period, 
And then the US government then used its it's power to. Killing in the music industry. Yeah, exactly. And then then the US government then used its power, a geopolitical power, to force other countries to adopt the same, you know, the same laws. They're not the original benefactors which are getting the money. Like George and Ira Gershwin, they're long gone. Anyway, sorry. Mm. No, it's okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, but the melody lingers on, I think. There was a yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> the melody sort of remains the same. There was a whole business, basically, in the United States where there, there was these addresses where patents were lobbied for certain, like, products. Mm. But when you go to these addresses, there was no one there. So people were losing their revenue because these patents were taken as well. And the things going on on YouTube at the moment where people are stealing um, other people's contents because they, they apply for them saying that they're their own. Yeah, and there's you know, a lot of you know, dirty tricks going on with uh, the go- you know, governments involved in, in stealing ideas. But the main thing is it, 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 it's a serious nightmare to go through this system if you're a, in a small business. It seriously benefits the incumbents and uh, you know, crony capitalists, big companies who also have, there's also a revolving door between the people that work in the intellectual property bureaucracy and the people that work at these big tech firms. So it's sort of, you know, this it's a very, very corrupt system in practice. I think like the progress of society has been inhibited because if you look what um, the fossil fuel industry did to like vehicles which were alternative to the carbon emitting ones, there was a lot of ideas of electric and uh, hydrogen about 1950s and earlier. They were already there, but they bought up the patents and restricted the restricted the production of them. Yeah, and of course it went the other way because the the rail lobby in Britain uh, deliberately tried to prevent the um, growth of uh, motoring in the, the car industry as well in the late nineteenth and early twentieth century. So this is you know typically how how um, crony capitalism, distribution of coalitions work with its rent seeking, capturing policy. You know, good examples. Yeah. This one here. Um, whether or not uh, one believes in the principle of uh, intellectual property rights, it seems to me that the gentleman behind me was correct. Uh, You might not call it theft or stealing, but uh, basically they're going outside themselves because they can't can't generate uh, this uh, innovation uh, within their own society because of the way their society is structured. So the the point that the gentleman was making, I think, is completely valid. But I think they've got an easy solution there, and I think probably um, you know they could easily liberalise the intellectual climate a bit. That'd be one solution. But the main solution they've got is because you know in 2014, on a, a properly measured, uh, China overtook the US as the world's largest economy. That's based on GDP at purchasing power parities, which is the the best measure. So they all they have to do is buy in expertise, and they're already doing that at their universities, they're just going to buy the best people from the West mm-hmm. who move to China, problem solved. Absolutely, and forming the best people. They yeah. Have, yeah, they have, yeah. I mean, millions and millions of students, so uh, it's uh, investing massively in education. Exactly, which is what they're doing That's already. That's what kept the US afloat, basically. They, they could buy in talent from elsewhere. But, well, sorry, uh, you buy in the talent, but you then you, you bring them, that talent into this climate where you don't have the incentives through intellectual property rights. Yeah, but they're not still have the same problem. Yeah, but the, the people who generally generally invent things, they generally they're not the ones who typically get rewarded in the, the Western <laughs> system. Then you have people who get ripped off by the crony capitalists. And there are numerous examples of it. Can I add to that? Really, in the modern age, you've really got to almost if if you're creative, you've got to you know know people know the lion by its roar, by its claw. Mm. You've got to make yourself in. in, in um, unremovable from your product. That that's the real test. Yeah, I mean the, the number. You know, if you look at the, you know, these big tech oligarchs in the U.S., it's more about their political uh, and business connections. They very rarely actually invented the stuff themselves. Absolutely, but, but that you that often stole, literally stole it from other people. But, mm. but that's true. And look, look, look. It's all sociobiology. You know, we've got the model of the cuckoo back in the wild. Mm. Still, yeah. people people have got to wise up. <coughs> yes. Um, it could be a good point of which to stop. <laughs> but, uh, any more? One of the yes. list? <clears throat> Richard, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested uh, in discerning a, a possible belief that, in some respects, we'd be better off um, going back from neoliberalism to more state control in certain sectors before we move forward to a, you know, a genuinely free market. Did I understand that correctly? And if so, which sectors were you thinking of? 
No, I, I prefer to to move straight to a uh, move to a free proper free market. But um, you may and <coughs> uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but you know the, the problem is I'm picking the the structures that are involved. <coughs> it, it's a real nightmare. You know, like we faced with the problem of privatising the electricity industry after the CEGB had been at it for decades and it produced something that was very much um, very much formed in a under a centrally planned mentality. It's not easy to go from there to a you know, proper free market. But the problem is, yeah, obviously, the, the politics of it is very difficult. So um, they forced these firms to, for example, like the post office or the electricity firms, to um, provide a universal service, even to you know some farm in the highlands of Scotland that's 10 miles from the nearest nearest power line and they weren't allowed to differentially charge and that's just one example where if they did actually abolish universal service provision then genuinely free market competition could start to emerge in those areas that weren't served by the uh, incumbent organisation but they, they wouldn't do that, they rigged the markets in a particular way. Um, but say, for, say for example the, uh, the, the railways perhaps you would have to have an inter intermediate stage where <coughs> Uh, the government took over the um, operating train operating companies, and then you went back to privatisation and did it properly the next time. So maybe in some sectors you would have to do that from a practical perspective. I think I'll have a go at this. How much of green fear has been used to advantage by certain sectors of the economy? <clears throat> well, exactly. So yeah, you've got got um, huge special interest groups. In fact, looking back, going back to the nineteen eighties, one of the a key industries that was in, instigating um, the uh, climate change alarmism was the nuclear power industry. And I think that's one of the industries that got to, to Margaret Thatcher and persuaded her to move in an environmentalist direction. Yeah, but obviously another, another one, a lot of the uh, financial sector would love to see uh, emissions trading schemes, preferably on a global or quasi-global basis. So that means they could basically get a small cut off basically any economic activity that's another source of lobbying for this sort of thing. And then clearly you've got this, this huge green energy industry that's emerged as well. Um, and I think, you know, there have been a couple of examples where um, former conservative energy ministers or environment ministers went, quickly went on to work for these green energy companies and even, you know, were made millions from it. So all this, you know, this rent, the whole environmental sort of green blob, as it's often uh, described as a massive special interest group that has a momentum all of its own. That's before we get on to how academia has been bribed to, um, you know, promote a particular <coughs> agenda with, you know, massive research grants from government. One last one. <laughs> yeah, this, is not, this is less a question than a comment. It was a fantastic talk. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And I know your PhD. Is it PhD or DPhil? PhD. It, I know it's in geography. And this well, it's, is it's, a, it's public choice theory, really. No, but this is a geographer's um, talk. I say that when I was at uni, people used to look down on people who were studying. I remember one of my colleagues, he took it up with the girl, he talked about getting the crayons out. What you've done is to do with disparity across domains, isn't it? Mm. So um, it's a fantastic talk, and that's what you, know, you learn in the Department of Geography. For instance, on this point, I only recently found out Jared Diamond, he's a professor of geography. Mm. Yeah, uh, it's superb. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dominic. Well, I think we can say thank you very much. Thank you.